This video is going to cover observational research, which is one of the types of exploratory research that we have. Now, unlike secondary research, observational research does require for you to go out and actually collect data, which means you're able to actually address more specific research questions that you might have. Now, we can spend a whole semester on good methods for observational research, but instead we're actually just going to focus on a small piece of this so you can get a flavor of what observational research looks like. And one of the ways for us to think about what observational research is, is actually to consider the advantages and disadvantages. So observational research is by definition an unobtrusive observation of people behaving in whatever manner they happen to be behaving in. The moment you actually interact with a person, we're not in observational land anymore. And so some of the advantages of this are, well, it's unobtrusive. People are going to behave the way that they normally behave, and that's fantastic. We get to observe them without influencing their behavior in any way. The data you often get from observational research are incredibly rich. I mean, think about it. People are out in the wild doing what they do. Very typical observations might happen in a shopping center where people are out, going to stores, picking up products, touching them, feeling them, seeing how they interact, maybe transacting, maybe not, maybe interacting with sales clerks, maybe not. All of that can be captured in an observational setting. And what's really kind of important is this can be very vivid information that is used to convince higher ups about decisions you want them to make. Now, to be clear, that is not good marketing research practice, but we live in the real world. Not only do you have to collect good data that should support any contentions that you have, but you need to be able to communicate that effectively and convince people. Well, I think a perfect solution is some version of good quantitative data with large samples, good measures, good statistics, complemented with some qualitative data like observational studies where you have videos of people behaving in their natural environment, and those behaviors actually support the conclusions that you drew from the more quantitative research. Anyway, the disadvantages for observational research are that you typically have small and non-representative samples. Well, it's hard to go out and observe thousands or hundreds of thousands of people because it's expensive to do. And so what that means is you have small samples and they tend not to be representative of all populations, but rather hyper-localized to wherever you happen to observe them. If you're observing in one supermarket over another, well, maybe that supermarket is different. Maybe that supermarket is in an affluent area or a less affluent area. It doesn't really speak to people in general, but only speaks to that little small ecosystem. So be very careful of the conclusions that you draw because they might not generalize. Beyond that, you often don't have quantitative data that you can actually speak to. There's nothing to crunch. There's no data to analyze and draw meaningful, statistically and scientifically valid conclusions. Rather, it's more suggestive of behaviors in general. And again, that's fine if that's your initial step. But if you're using that for decision making, that's when you start getting into trouble. So to kind of make this case why observational research can be so powerful, one of my favorite books, one that I pretty much recommend to all students, is this book, Why We Buy by Paco Underhill. Now, Paco Underhill was a very successful consultant who I would say changed quite a bit of what happened in the retail environment, and he did it largely through observational research. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a few facts on the screen about grocery stores, which are a place where Paco Underhill did quite a bit of work. And what I'd like you to do is at least pause for a moment and think about why these things might be true, and I'll show you what they are in just a second. So our first question is, why are frequently purchased items like bread and milk typically towards the back of a supermarket? Think about that for a second. So what's funny about this one is that there's two answers to this. The answer that Paco Underhill will tell you is that it increases what we call incidental purchases. We know that many people who shop in stores they don't plan out every single purchase that they're going to make. Instead, they just pick stuff up along the way. And if the things they always needed, the staple goods, right, like the breads and the milks and the eggs, were right at the front of the store next to the cash register, well, they'd just walk in the store, buy their milk and eggs, and leave. And they'd never have a chance to buy extra things, those incidental purchases. So stores put those in the back to force you to at least walk through the store once before getting the things you meant to come for, increasing incidental purchases, and that's great. So that's answer number one. Turns out there's a second answer, and actually I'll provide a link for you uh, to a wonderful NPR story that talks about the cold chain. And in particular, it talks about the fact that in order to maintain the cold continuity of produce that, that needs to remain cold, like think milk, think eggs, think dairy, those refrigerated shelves need to be as close to the loading dock as possible, which tends to be at the back of a store. So the truck pulls up, it's refrigerated, you take it out of the truck that's not refrigerated, but as quickly as possible you put it back into your refrigerated storage spaces, which happen to be towards the back of the store. And if you ask a whole bunch of grocers which one is true, they kind of look at you and they say, yeah, it's probably both. So it's a nice example of where observational research, looking to see that people are buying incidental things, that people are buying things that they weren't planning to buy, uh, informed some of the structure of a supermarket, though there may also be secondary reasons for it. Anyway, the next thing you might want to ask is, well, why is the grocery cart the size that it is? Right? It could be smaller, it could be bigger. So again, think about that for a second. Well, the grocery cart is actually often used as a cue to tell you when you're done shopping. If the grocery cart were teeny tiny, 
then you just put a few items in it and you'd leave and you wouldn't have the opportunity to fill it out. And so making it bigger allows people to actually buy more. That queue of are you done shopping has not been reached yet because you have a bigger cart. Now there's a limit to this, of course, and the limit is the aisle width. So every store has to manage two things. They want as many products as they possibly can, but they also have to let people navigate the aisles. So how big you make them is gonna be a function of the grocery cart size. If the grocery cart is gigantic, well, yes, you're gonna allow people to buy more stuff, on the other hand, you're going to take away space from selling products and give it towards room for the carts to actually move. So the observation there was, well, people wouldn't stop when they were done shopping in the sense that they finished all their needs, in the sense that they got everything that they needed. Rather, they'd stop when their cart was full. So somebody noticed that and said, oh, wait a second, we should be very mindful about the size of shopping carts. So the next one is that store brands are typically placed to the right of named or national brands in grocery stores. So if I'm facing a store, on the right is where the store brand is, and on the left is where the named national brand is. Why might that be? So it turns out, in the United States, most people are right-handed. And the thing that you should know is that store brands tend to have a higher margin for grocers than the national brands. And so everything that a grocery store can do to encourage sales of slightly higher margin products is worth doing. And if I tend to reach with my right hand, well, I have a slight preference to things that happen to be easier to reach, which means I'm more likely to buy those store brand products, hopefully increasing margins for the grocery store. And again, people notice this. Well, look, people aren't systematically switching left versus right hand when they shop. They always tend to use the right hand if they're right-handed, and most people in the United States are right-handed. So you use that information to inform the structure of how you lay out your grocery store. So here's another one about sidedness. Why are high profit items on the right side of an aisle as you go into the grocery store? So you're heading in on the right side are the high profit, high margin items compared to the left side. Think about that for a second. And it has nothing to do with handedness. Well, it turns out in the US, we walk on the right side of the street. We drive on the right side of the street. And if you're going into the store, you're more likely to have more space in your shopping cart. So if you're gonna be grabbing an incidental item, you're gonna be grabbing one that is a higher margin item. The opposite should be true in the UK, where you drive on the left side of the street, and so you would have an opposite result there. Again, small effect, but it could actually increase margin for a grocer, which is all that they need. Now remember, this is a costless decision. Put it on the right and put it on the left. It really doesn't matter that much, but if you could increase margin ever so slightly by putting it on the right, well, you do it. So the last one should be an easy one. Why are Fruit Loops, Cocoa Puffs, things of that nature, on lower shelves than, let's say, healthier cereal like uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes? Well, hopefully this one's straightforward enough. Kids, when they go to the store, they grab a cereal box that looks pretty and has cool decorations advertised towards them. They might grab that, hand it to their parent, and say, I want what I want. And they're not going to do that if it's sitting high up on a shelf. So if someone noticed that children are feeding these things to their parents to buy, and the children are the decision makers. So if the product is being advertised towards children with colorful imagery and fun characters, you put that at a lower shelf level so they have the accessibility to actually reach that. So this is just one example of one retail setting looking at how observations, and specifically just unobtrusive observations, can make a dramatic impact on how you lay out your store shelves. Now, I hope that none of the grocery stores did this all on a whim just by watching one or two people do this. I hope they use this as an impetus to actually go out and test these ideas and validate that they work and then roll them out nationally or internationally. And if they do work, and if these are successful, they, with that follow-on research, you can make real meaningful changes to the bottom line of grocery stores. And just to be clear, when I say observation, this doesn't have to be a person following someone around a grocery store. It could be a series of cameras located strategically to see how people are behaving. And so long as you can observe the natural behavior that people are engaging in without intervening, you can get a lot of information out of them. So again, to conclude, observational research, super powerful for initial hypothesis generation. Not very useful for making decisions. It is useful, however, for getting you ideas to then follow up on. In the next video, we'll look at a different form of exploratory research ethnographic research.